Um, thank you, and especially thank you, Melissa, for uh, allowing me to give one of the keynote presentations at this wonderful uh, conference. I, my name is Valentina Mazzucato. I am not part of the IS Academy, although we are working closely with Melissa and others in Maastricht University in a newly created center of uh, Maastricht University Center on Citizenship, uh, Migration and Development called Maximine. Um, what I'm going to be talking about is the effects of parental migration on children in origin countries. And um, this is a project, it, it's going to be re reporting on results from two projects uh, called the Transnational Child Raising Arrangement between Africa and Europe projects. They're financed by Face and the Dutch National Science Foundation and they are a collaborative um, effort uh, of various universities, both located in Europe as well as in Africa. Um, what these projects do is they look at transnational families. And just to be clear what we mean by transnational families, we look at um, when a migrant parent moves to Europe, in this case a woman who is working in Amsterdam Southeast as a hairdresser, um, who moves but leaves her child back in, in this case, Ghana, uh, in the care of her mother. And these three types of actors, the parent who migrates, the child who stays behind, child or children who stay behind, as well as the caregivers who then are taking care of these children, are who we consider to be transnational families. And we're interested in understanding um, what are the effects of migration on each of these types of actors. Now, it might be, seem a little bit strange to start a conference on migration and development with uh, one of the keynotes on families, because actually, um, when talking about migration and development, families are not one of the big topics. But when you think about it, really, um, families as the basic building block of society um, are actually quite fundamental in any process of development for any society, be it in the global south or in the global north. So having well-functioning families, people who are uh, performing well in their jobs or who are uh, feeling emotionally fine, is actually quite fundamental for any kind of development. And therefore, I'm very glad that Melissa gave me the opportunity to talk about families in a conference on migration and development. So why study them? Um, actually, very little is known about transnational families because not so much research effort has gone into studying these types of families until about a decade ago. But there are some reports from, for example, UNICEF or other organizations that have reported, for example, that one million Sri Lankan children are living without their mothers because their mothers have migrated abroad. That's quite a sizable population of children. <coughs> or in the Philippines, 27% of all minors have at least one parent overseas. That's enormous, 27%. In Moldova, this number has been recorded at 35%. And in Ghana, the country that, that I'm most familiar with, in certain regions of Ghana, 44% um, of all minors are living without at least one of their parents because of migration. So these numbers are enormous, but these numbers are also very, we don't really know. You know they're based on very um, quick and dirty type of research, and there hasn't really been some uh, very grounded research about them, and not, very, um, not a lot of statistical data collection on them. But also why it's important to study transnational families, and the reason why they haven't really been focused on, is that we're very used to talking about migration either as an issue about the receiving country, the country that receives migrants. And we see, all, we ask all sorts of questions, especially about their ability to integrate in the receiving country society. Do migrants integrate? Are they participating in society? If so, how? Are they overly represented in criminal activities? Or are they underrepresented in their children in educational, um, in certain types of education, for example? Or we ask the question that we're asking at this conference from the sending country side, looking at does migration lead to development? Can the migration of people actually help the de development of the countries where migrants come from? And usually these contexts and these questions that we ask are very much separate and, and remain separate of each other. So we don't bridge um, what's happening between the receiving and the sending country side. We tend to look at either migrants in the, sending, in the receiving country or their families back home. And 
my transnational families, by the very nature of what they are, are actually a phenomenon that bridge both contexts. So it's forcing us to ask questions and to research these things by employing multi-sided methods, for example, by being both in receiving countries as well as sending countries. And so these two contexts are hardly ever linked. And very often, the main focus of this research is on economic outcomes. So when we talk about development relating to the last question that was asked in the previous, when we talk about migration and development, we're usually thinking about economic development. When we're talking about migration and integration, we often think about integration as a means to obtain eco, you know, the best economic profit that we can from migrants who are coming into our countries. And therefore, families are not really seen as something about economics. Families is something that you know, the sociologists or, or anthropologists study. But actually, again, what I am hoping to convince you by the end of this lecture is that really the family is at the basis of any kind of uh, integration or development processes that go on in either of the countries. And that's why we should be interested in them. So, <clears throat> Uh, we do these two projects, look at three African uh, flows from Angola, Nigeria, and Ghana into three European countries, Portugal, Netherlands, and um, Ireland. And these three countries in Africa were chosen because they represent significant <coughs> flows into these European countries. Um, now, we first start, started by saying, okay, well, what, what is known about transnational families? How are these people who are separated um, because someone in the family migrates, how are they there? And we came upon, upon these transnational family studies, which are stemming from a branch of migration studies. And these are largely qualitative um, trans and, and uh, family <coughs> studies and have really been fundamental for emphasizing and bringing to the fore the negative consequences that uh, family members experience by being um, separated due to migration. So this is sort of another side of the coin of the remittance story, which tends to be quite a positive story about, hey, migrants are sending back all this money, and um, in certain cases it helps bring families out of poverty. But here, these qualitative small-scale studies were actually sort of bringing an alarm bell and saying, hey, there's some negative well-being effects here. Um, for example, they were uh, describing depression or stress, the feelings of stress um, or feelings of abandonment, or guilt, sorry, on the part of parents who had to forcefully or, you know, weren't able to reunite with their children once they migrated. Vice versa, they also documented feelings from the children's side of abandonment, for example, or not understanding why their parent isn't coming back or isn't getting them and bringing them over. So, creating a lot of stress and dissatisfaction in, in both sides of the equation. These studies also notice that there are differences between how mothers and fathers experience these separations, how important the caregiver is in mediating these kinds of relationships and, for example, explaining to the child why the parent migrated, the quality of the relationship in these triad, so with the caregiver, the lack of tension, the tensions that might arise between in, within these families, so the quality of these relationships are very important as well as the expectations, realistic expectations for reunification that people had in this triad was very important and this had a lot to do with information and communication amongst the people involved. Um, however, there, these studies remain small scale and they often, actually never, compared these families with families who are actually living together in the origin countries. So it was very difficult to really say whether these things, these negative outcomes that they were finding was really due to these families being transnational, these families being separated, or was it due to other things that might have been characterizing these, these families? And um, the predominant focus has been on the effects of parents, and especially mothers. So we set out to try to look at this in combining both quantitative and qualitative methods. And right away, when we started, we came across the sort of the puzzle, because we were getting quotes from children who we were interviewing in Africa, such as this one, Emmanuel, who's actually quite okay with his father migrating because he buys him things now. Before, he wasn't able to buy him things. So there's this, you know, what's been called the commodification of care. Parents are now able to send uh, goods, money, but also gadgets like uh, iPhones to their children. But then you have quotes like this one, that of Puma, an 18-year-old 
who is actually showing quite a lot of resentment about his father's migration. You know, he, his father calls him and he says, what do you want from me? Um, and he says, you know, ever since um, I was born and when I was in junior high school and senior high school, you've never really catered for me. And this telephone call ended up with, with Puma hanging up on his father. It shows a lot of resentment and lack of understanding of his father's situation and lack of communication between the child and the father. But then here's Jacqueline who completely reverses Puma's uh, uh, you know, resentment and it actually shows a lot of understanding for why her mother uh, migrated and is saying, you know, when she was in Ghana, she wasn't doing anything. She was just, you know, sewing people's clothes and she wasn't getting much money for that. Now she's actually able to do something. So this shows us some understanding. And finally, what is, I think, very characteristic for the African context, you have Gottlieb, a 13-year-old, who's actually showing the possibility for children to actually say, I have two moms. I have the mom who's taking care of me here in Ghana, and I also have my, my real mom, my biological mom in the UK, who's also taking care of me. So there's a way of being able to rationalize your situation and accept your situation and see yourself as being a child to more than one parent. So how to make sense of all of these quotes that show resentment, that show understanding, that show benefits, that show costs? And that's what we set out to do um, by also trying to engage uh, and, and do some quantitative studies on this, not only qualitative, and to do them from both sides, the, the children's perspectives as well as the parents' perspective. So we turned to some ch child psychology and family studies, and here we found that um, where they were looking at this in more quantitative ways, but we found that they were focusing on families who are living together, or when they're focusing on families that are not living together, it was families who were not living together because of divorce or because of some crisis in the family, but really they weren't looking at families who were not living together because of migration. So that already indicated another gap that we didn't really know about what was happening. Secondly, these studies were based on clinical data, and clinical data is by virtue of the fact that it's clinical data really focusing on extreme cases and usually negative cases. And finally, they were mainly based on weird societies. So these are Western, educated, industrial, rich, and developed societies. That's you. Um, basically, most of these studies are done in uh, Northern uh, European or Northern American campuses with experiments with graduate students or undergraduate students. So we know a lot about how you students think, but we don't really know much about how families from developing countries are found. Um, there has been, though, some recent attention on transnational families, and the gaps are that there's been hardly any attention to Africa. Um, there's uh, hardly any discussion with the qualitative literature, so they weren't really looking at what the insights were in the qualitative literature, and it was primarily based on adult assessment. So now I'm going to bring you to our study and to Africa, and I'm going to focus on the part of our study that has looked at what are the effects of parental migration on children who stay behind, and specifically focusing on the psychological effects. Basically saying that, you know, that's the first ingredient. If you're going to perform well in school, you've got to be psychologically doing well, otherwise you're not going to be able to perform in school. So here are the three countries, and in the three countries we conducted a survey with a minimum of 2,250 2, pupils in junior and senior secondary schools. So this meant an uh, age range between 11 to 21 years old. We randomly selected the schools in high out-migration areas. So these are not surveys that are nationally representative, but they're representative for high out-migration areas in these countries. Uh, these are just some basic background information on the three flows. I'm not going to give you all of this in information. I just want to highlight a couple of things that are going to be important for understanding the results that we got. Sorry. First is that in all three countries, norms around child fostering and social parenthood are prevalent in terms of what is considered to be a proper upbringing for a child. What this means is that it's quite normal and sometimes even considered the best option <coughs> to have your child be raised by someone who is not the biological parent of the child. So you can foster your child to an auntie, to your sister, to your mother. Usually it's a woman, not always. Um, sometimes it's in the mother's family, sometimes it's in the father's family. But it's considered to be completely appropriate and not a second best solution. It can even be a first best solution. And this is really important to emphasize to especially Western audiences, because this is so different 
from how instead we think about family and how much emphasis we tend to put in that the best solution for a child is to be raised by both biological parents. Um, that's not to say that these, you know, the nuclear and, and biological families do not are not considered to be um, appropriate in these societies. It's just that there are other ways of fit, forming family. But one big difference is in the Angola case is that Angola has suffered from civil strife from its independence from Portugal in 1975 up until 2002. And this has had devastating effects on families. It has split families. It has um, killed people in families. It has spread them all over, not only in Angola, but even outside of Angola, the borders, and even abroad. So there's been a large disruption to families due to the war. And finally, another difference I want to emphasize is that for Ghana and Nigeria, migration has been mainly characterized by labor migrants, whereas in Angola, because of the civil strife, this has been mainly been refugees. There's some other points, but I'm not going to dwell on those right now. So <clears throat> we asked, okay, what is the psychological well-being of these children in these three countries? Um, uh, and we did this by looking at a total difficulties. Um, score. I'm not going to bore you too much with this, but I just want to give you an impression of what we were asking. We asked children themselves with very simple questions, things like, I'm nice to other people, I fight a lot, um, I'm often unhappy. And this is a, a, an in, a, a tool that has actually been developed expressly for asking children of the age range that we were looking at, and has actually been developed for the cross-cultural context. That is, it has been applied to various cultures in various countries, and it, children seem to understand these questions in a way that you come up with a quite reliable measurement of their psychological level. And this is what we find. The blue line are those children who are living with both of their parents in the origin country. And the pink line is the, uh, are those children who are living with at least one parent away internationally. The higher the score, the worse you're doing. So across the board, in all three countries, all in, in the picture that is very simple, children who are living in a family with a migrant parent are doing worse than children who are living with both of their parents. So this kind of um, reinforces the story that we had found in the qualitative studies that were emphasizing you know, the negative aspects of migration. But then we said, well, let's go a step further. Let's look at all of these different dimensions that were actually mentioned in the literature as being important. So let's look at whether um, the child raising arrangement is actually stable, i.e., is the caregiver always the same caregiver, or is the child, once the parent migrates, changing from caregiver to another caregiver? Secondly, who is the caregiver? Is it the other parent? Is it a grandparent? Is it an auntie, an uncle? Does this make a difference? Thirdly, which parent migrates? Is it the mother, the biological mother, or the biological father? The literature mentioned that there might be a difference there. And finally, where do these migrants migrate to? Does that make a difference? So we applied some uh, regression techniques in order to estimate these equations. We estimated separate equations for each country, separate models for each transnational family dimension, and we added clusters of control variables in a stepwise fashion. We had these control variables that meant that we tried to control for different aspects that might be influencing how children are doing psychologically, because we only wanted to figure out what contribution is the migration making to their psychological well-being. And let me just start with the overall, the big the story. The story is that living in a transnational family is not necessarily associated with worse outcomes for children. So this to us is an important finding because it's actually quite contradictory to the things that I've said until now. But, and here's where I think our story has something to contribute, especially to policy-making audiences, we also identify that certain characteristics of the child-raising arrangement have to be in place for it not to have negative outcomes for children. And this is important for us because this is where maybe we can think about or start to think about certain policy measures where we might, um, we might be able to intervene. And the second point, because we have this cost-country comparative uh, setup, we can actually try to start to understand how the context of the country matters. So if we see differences between these types of families in the different countries, are there differences in these countries that might be contributing to 
but in certain countries there might be worse effects than others. So here are the findings. Um, first, we looked at the stability of the caregiver. And um, the way to read this is, again, the longer the bar, the worse the outcome. If the bar is filled in, it means it's statistically significant. That is, there is a difference between children who are living with a parent on migration and children who are living with both parents. When the bar is not filled in, it means that there's no difference between these two types of families. So we're interested in both the filled-in bars as well as the non-filled-in bars. So the first thing I want to show is that the top bar in this graph shows the very unstable caregiving. That is, when the child is moving from caregiver to caregiver. And across the board, it shows that those children who are moving from caregiver to caregiver are much worse off than those children who are living with both of their parents. Okay? So this is important because it's something that, at least for migration, literature has not been said. This has always been said for, for example, children of divorced parents. But it's not been said for children in mig migrant families. Um, another important thing is that, at least for the Ghana and Nigeria case, and I will come back to the Angola case later, but we don't find any statistical difference in the well-being of children when um, the, in the bottom bar, which is that they've never changed their caregiver, that is, they have a very stable caregiving situation, there is no difference between those children with a migrant parent and those children without a migrant parent. Again, really emphasizing the story that <coughs> caregiver stability seems to be a very important element. Now, who is the caregiver? Does that make a difference? So, again, Ghana and Nigeria show similar trends. The top three bars indicate if the caregiver was a sibling or a non-kin, if the caregiver was a grandparent, or if the caregiver was an auntie or an uncle. And in all three cases, it doesn't make, seem to make a difference in the well-being of children. So if you are with a migrant parent or not, it doesn't make a difference in your well-being. However, we did find this rather surprising or counterintuitive thing, which is the bottom bar, that is whether the other carer is the other parent at least to, I think, our Western sensibilities, one would think that if one parent is going to go on, on migration, it's at least better if the other parent is taking care of the child. And instead, this is not the case. From qualitative information that we've been gathering from the different sites, we actually find that in many um, cases, marital relationships in which just one of the partners migrates and the other stays behind can lead to a lot of tension, especially in the situations where the person who's overseas is not sending remittances for whatever reason, is not calling and communicating for whatever reason, and is not able to come and visit and, and, and see, have some face-to-face -face contact. So what we think we're picking up, and this leads to distrust in the couple, this leads to tensions, this leads to accusations, <coughs> and what we think we're picking up here is actually that children are suffering from the type of marital tensions that can arise um, during migration between the couples. International versus national migration. So does it, this is the only part of the analysis where we include national migrants. What do I mean by national migrants? People who, for example, in Ghana, leave their child in one city and migrate to another city to go and work in that city. So here we looked at whether this makes a difference. So is there a difference between parents who migrate internationally versus whether they migrate nationally? And lo and behold, what you find is that the top bar, which is large and significant, is that when parents are away internationally, it does make a big difference for children in terms of worse outcomes. Um, whereas when, sorry, whereas when they migrate nationally, at least in the Ghana and Nigeria case, it doesn't seem to make a difference. And of course, we need to go into this more and understand what's behind this, but one of the main differences between these, parent, these two types of parents, the national and international ones, was how much face-to-face -face contact they had with their child. Finally, who migrates? Um, we looked at whether both parents migrate, um, whether only the mother migrates and leaves the child with the father, or whether the father migrates and leaves the child with the mother. And again here, what you see is in the Nigeria and the Ghana case, that the top bar, which is when both parents are away, actually we didn't find any significant differences with families who were actually, where families were living together in the country of origin. But in all, in all three countries, we find strong and significant differences when the mother moves, when the mother migrates. And this, again, reemphasizes some of the findings from the smaller scale qualitative studies that seem to indicate that mother's migration has, 
has more emotional outcomes for both, for, in this case, children. And here I want to come back to this because there's a, a, an important story that we need to try to look at. What is this gender difference? Why, what is it due to? But because we also have these broader contextual variables in our um, regressions and also in the different countries that we're studying, we, can also, we also found that having sufficient living conditions were, in any case, whether you were in a migrant family or a non-migrant family, was very important for the well-being of the child, for the psychological well-being of the child. And children attending the better quality schools were actually, uh, that was also very important for child's well-being. So these are important elements because they indicate, at least from the perspective of sending country governments, governments where the migrants come from, these are two areas of intervention, you know, making sure that children are living in, in having sufficient basic needs and having, making sure that the quality of schools that they're attending is actually high are ways that you can actually affect and minimize any kind of negative effects of migration on, on the psychological well-being of children. But finally, conflict and post-conflict settings um, make children most vulnerable to migration effects. And here I just want to, don't worry if you can't see these very well, these are the graphs that I've just shown you. Um, and I just want to come back to the Angola case. Look at these, look at these four slides. And in all cases, the Angola bars are always large and they're always significant. So Angola really shows a very different trend from the other two countries. And um, this goes to reinforce, I think, a lot of the findings from the um, post-conflict settings literature and, and, and psychology literature that shows and argues that people having suffered from uh, conflict or having suffered traumas from conflict are actually much more vulnerable to any shocks to their system. So in the children's case, a migration of a parent is a shock to their system. And they're much more vulnerable to this. Children are going to react much more and are going to have much worse outcomes than um, in certain, in these kinds of contexts than in others. So this is also something for us to think about as, you know, thinking policy issues. It seems that there are certain types of families that we both, in terms of sending country governments or receiving country governments, need to be aware of and, and be thinking particularly of, of the kinds of negative consequences that migration might be having for them. So, um, uh, the, I, I have two sets of conclusions, so don't think that I'm coming to the end of my talk. I still have a little bit more. My first set of conclusions um, is that transnational family life is not always associated with negative psychological well-being, and I want to emphasize this because the fact that we find that in certain cases there are no differences is important. But then what's equally important is to say, okay, but under what conditions can families actually prosper um, by living separate from each other? And one of the and, and these these, uh, that's my second point, these different dimensions seem to be quite important. So for example, the stability across the board is extremely important. Um, the, who is the caregiver is not that important, it's just if the other parent is the migrant. Um, the gender of the migrant parent is extremely important, and as is the location of migration. And the home country context is important in terms of um, mediating or, or uh, affecting these effects. Um, so the living conditions of the school systems that children are living under, as well as what I think is also playing why we don't find necessarily negative effects in certain cases is these norms of um, upbringing that I mentioned to you are creating situations in which children do not feel um, some kind of um, taboo or some kind of uh, negative stigma if, if their parent has, if they're not living with their parent, because this is actually something that children, um, it, that is quite common. And finally, the conflict, post-conflict context is very important. But now, because we also study the parents, I just want to make some connections with the other side. Because <coughs> what I've been telling you about is the side of the children and how they're faring and what conditions seem to be important to be in place for these children to be able to prosper. But these conditions are very closely linked to how the parents are doing on the other side. So what have we found in terms of the emotional well-being of parents? And I'm just going to show you a couple of slides on this. Um, but basically, money and mobility make a difference. So let's start from looking at, so we looked at Angolans in Portugal, Angolans in the Netherlands, Nigerian parents in Ireland, Nigerian parents in the Netherlands, and Ghanaian parents in the Netherlands. And if you look at the, the blue bar, 
the, that's when you are in a transnational family. The only time when it was actually affected parents' well-being, that is the only time when parents were actually worse off in terms of the emotional well-being because they were in a transnational family, were in two cases. That's on Angolans in both cases. Angolans in the Netherlands and Angolans in Portugal. These were the two cases where parents were actually suffering because emotionally because or psychologically because of being in a transnational family. Um, uh, there, in, in the other um, cases, actually what seemed to be really um, um, affecting their better well-being, because if you, the more this, the bars are on this side means that they're actually better um, off, is whether the parents were documented, had documented status, and whether they had income, okay? So these were the more, the, the more important variables driving the well-being of parents, more so than being in a transnational family. So this indicated to us that if you are documented and if you do have a sizable or a decent income, that actually you're going to be experiencing being in a transnational family in a very different way than if you're undocumented and if you don't have income. So the explanation of some of this that's coming out from the qualitative um, uh, research that we're doing, and one of the papers will be presented um, on Friday on this, is that actually some parents, when they have a choice, opted to keep their child in the origin country. That is, keeping your child in the origin country could be seen as the best solution. Why? Because some parents felt that their children had better prospects, educational prospects. Um, being educated in an English language system, for example, for the Nigerians and the Ghanaians, was much better than bringing their children to the Netherlands, where the children would have had to learn Dutch and wouldn't have necessarily qualified for going on to university education in the UK, in Canada, and North America. They also felt, some parents say, they're more, my children then are still more in touch with their own culture. And parents could also focus on their own jobs and their own earning rather than having to also cater to their children and be engaged in childcare. However, certain conditions needed to be present for those parents to feel okay about the transnational, being in a transnational family. One was their ability to send remittances back home. Secondly was having regular and, and some face-to-face -face contact with their children back home. And finally, it was having a good support network in general. And here I just want to show you the, the parallels between these three findings and the findings of the children. Because ability to send remittances back home allows you to ensure sufficient living conditions for children, which was one of the conditions that children had to have for having good um, psychological well-being. Sending remittances back home also enables you to send your child to a good school. Good schools usually charge the higher fees, so you can pay those higher fees. Sending remittances back home also reduce the strain on the relationship with the caregiver because you are meeting the expectations that, you, that the caregiver has of you being able to remit. Having some regular um, contact and some face-to-face -face was actually was enabling parents to maintain a healthy relationship, sorry, children to maintain a healthy relationship with their migrant parent. And finally, having a good support network in Ghana was creating a stable caregiving environment that if you have a good support network in Ghana, you can choose amongst these caregivers and select the one that you think is going to be the best caregiver and who is ultimately going to be the stable caregiver for this, um, for your child. So the findings on money, mobility, and migration regimes, actually what, we're, what, what affects parents' abilities to cater to their children's well-being are both visa and family reunification policies in the, in the host countries, in the receiving countries, as well as um, low income or earning possibilities in the, in the receiving countries, which, which impact the functioning of these transnational families and the well-being of parents. And these, we think, are unintended consequences of these, of these policies and of these programs. It's not what they're intended to do, but it's, so it's important to at least highlight that there are these effects of these policies. So migrant parents who are documented and or have a higher level of income do not necessarily suffer from being in a transnational family, Conversely, those who are undocumented and have low income can enter into this downward spiral of ill-functioning transnational families, which ultimately impacts their and their children's well-being. I just want to return to this aspect of the gender. Um, to be honest, this fact that when mothers migrate, it's worse for the children really bugs me. 
<laughs> it bugs me because I'm afraid of people starting to stigmatize women when they migrate. When they migrate out of necessity and out of helping um, to try to help their families better off. So I, you know, I'm trying to understand this finding. Why is it? So in my, migrant mothers showed worse well-being than men in all cases except for enrolling women in the Netherlands and Nigerian women in Ireland. And children had lower well-being in all cases when their mothers migrated while they were left behind with their, with their fathers. And so what, what's driving these, you know, what's behind this? So looking at the literature, well, there are those authors that made the biology argument. The biology argument is, you know, the, there's a special attachment between mothers and children. So when children are missing that special motherly love, a special motherly attention, they're going to be missing that kind of emotional care that they need. I cannot prove or disprove this argument. Um, I just leave it there for you to think about. But I do want to emphasize that there are a couple of other things at play here. One is, and this again from our search of the literature, is that policies such as migration policies, family reunification policies, might be hitting women harder than men. And I say might. And there's some literature out there that, that seems to indicate that they are. So that the requirements, for example, for family reunification are more difficult for women to meet than men to meet. Meaning that there's a higher proportion of women who are in a transnational family because they're forced rather than because they chose. Whereas there might be a higher proportion of men who are in a transnational family because they chose and not because they felt forced. So this is something to, to you know, think about and certainly for policymakers to maybe ask for more investigation on this um, aspect. Are women being hit harder uh, than men? But secondly, uh, thirdly, I want also mention something that our results um, point to is that women seem to have, for the back, back, lack of a better word, weaker support networks in their home countries. Um, so, for example, here what you see is that in the state, those children, those um, yes, those children who were in a stable caregiving arrangement um, um, were. Um, and I read this correctly. Yeah, so more, more fathers are in a stable care, have children in a stable caregiving arrangement than mothers. A higher proportion of fathers have their children in a stable caregiving arrangement than mothers. And vice versa, a higher proportion of women have their children in an unstable caregiving arrangement. So this says something about why is it that women have their children in unstable arrangements? And we just saw how important this stability of the caregiving arrangement is. Um, so what is it about women's network that make that their children are moving? Or what is it about marital relationships and, and, the, and the, uh, you know, the, the relationships between, uh, the, let's say, the ownership of the child and who decides on who the child should be staying with that's making it so that when the migrant is the mother, the child is changing more um, and has more unstable conditions. So my second set of conclusions, just to link um, the context between here and there, between receiving country and sending country, is that the well-being of children there, the well-being of children back home, is affected by how well these transnational families are able to function. And the way that these transnational families are able to function needs to meet certain conditions. And these certain conditions are affected by migration and family reunification policies and job opportunities in Europe. So it's important to draw these linkages and to realize that well-being of children back home can have can, can be impacted by the types of policies that we have um, in receiving countries. So because Melissa has really urged me, yes, make some policy recommendations, and this is not what I'm good at. Uh, but I do want to end with some, you know, let, let's think about what could these um, findings be indicating. So from the sending country perspective, you know, maybe we could be starting to think about information for parents about the preparations before they migrate. So this idea that it's really important to have a stable caregiver, um, you know, maybe have some information about this for parents um, because it doesn't seem to be something that is um, really discussed and talked about when parents leave. It's almost, um, it, it's a decision that is, is not really um, 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 discussed in, in great detail with the caregiver. 
Um, also, the quality of school and basic living conditions, as I mentioned to you, these could be areas in which you can intervene in order to try to ameliorate the conditions of, of children in general, but also of migrant children in particular. And um, thirdly, at least from the sending country perspective, I think it would be interesting and useful for them to try to understand why is it that women seem to have weaker networks. And from a receiving country side, so from the side of, of the countries that are receiving migrants, um, it's I think it's important for us to be asking and, and really seriously investigating what, you know, are these policies that we're implementing hitting women harder than men? Um, because I don't think that that's the intention of any policymaker, um, and therefore, if that's an unintended consequence, let's see why this is the case, and is there any way that we can develop um, these policies so that they're a little bit less gender biased, if they are. Um, but also, I think it's important to think about, and this relates also to some things that Melissa was saying, is how can we help facilitate remittances, but also face-to-face -face contact with children, which seems so important. You know, yes, of course, in today's day and age of information and communication technologies, and it's possible to Skype with your child, and it's possible to SMS and email, and that's wonderful. It, it allows for the maintenance of parent-child relationships, but it's not enough. You need the face-to-face, -face, and it needs to be, you know, every, on a regular basis. So how can we allow that? How can that, you know, can, can we think of policy measures that might facilitate that? Um, and thirdly, particular attention, I think, we need to think about is, is particular attention to families from conflict and post-conflict states, um, which seem to be suffering much more in terms of the psychological effects that migration has on both parents as well as children, and, um, and, and that this is, this is really a, a special case that we need to be thinking about. Thank you. suggestions and um, especially to the fellow um, policymakers or people practitioners any any um, things that you found might be particularly useful yeah thank you for your presentation a very interesting research um, I have a question on the control group um, did you use family specifically that were with both parents present, or were there also uh, families who had only one parent present because the father is away, or the mother is inside, or yeah. okay. and, and another question is, have you also considered to look at uh, families where the, the parent has returned, and what effect that Yeah. Um, maybe, Shall I feel the, I'll do it differently. I'll feel a few questions, collect a few questions, and then answer them. So, Ron. Thanks, Valentina. And my question, I think, is pretty obvious coming from me, but I'd be interested in, in parallels with, with Asian countries, and particularly the results that came out of the Champsi project. Because I think there's, a, there's an important difference in, in, in these migrations because the movements out of the Philippines, Indonesia, so on, dominated by women. Uh -huh. But they came up with similar findings to you. In fact, the differences between those families with uh, lots of with, with migrants and uh, those without were not that significant. Yeah. So I think, you know, preserve me for saying this, but is there something cultural here? Okay, great question. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Valentina. Very interesting. And I, I also was uh, somehow bothered by these gender differences, and I just started thinking maybe I've missed it. But do you also look at, the, let's say, the, the, the sex of the child, whether it makes a difference in terms of well-being, whether the father or the mother has gone? And what I was also wondering, what's the prevalence, let's say, of who actually migra migrates? Is it the mother or father? I would expect that more men are migrating, but maybe I'm actually mistaken. So to put it somehow into perspective, and whether it's just the girls at home are treated or the boys are treated different <coughs> from whether it's the father or the mother stays at home. Yeah. Okay. Richard. Hi, Gina, thanks. Um, I'm also bothered by this uh, finding that um, Good. Uh, children <laughs> suffer more if uh, their mothers migrate than, than the fathers, but I'm not surprised <coughs> by it. And, and I am surprised that you didn't talk about 
the social construction, the gender, uh, social construction of gender roles within families. And surely this is not, um, it's surely not a biological uh, loss. But if the dominant discourse in sending society is, is that the loss of a mother is a problem, then that's going to tend towards it being a problem, whether it is biologically so or not. So I wonder, I mean, one way of testing that would be to look at a counterfactual where the dominant discourse of women being absent is not a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Although what Rob said about the Asian examples perhaps suggests that that isn't helpful. Yeah. Um, I'm going to just stop here for a second, re reply, especially because they um, relate so nicely to each other, and then I'll uh, collect some more questions um, because time will definitely permit. So let me just start with this gender book. Um, um, I think Ron's and Richard's um, observations are really um, important here because, well, Ron, I think one, one point to make is methodological. Um, so I, you're right, these Asian Champsi studies actually studying very different contexts, very different types of migration streams, also don't find these kinds of effects. And, um, and we, together with the Champsi, are really um, one of the few studies, large-scale studies, that have actually combined quantitative surveys on this specific issue and qualitative information. So I think that what's happening is that when you interview a mother about her child in her home country, she's going to be sad and she's going to be unhappy and she might even start crying and it, you know, it's horrible. The problem is that when you're interviewing the mother, you don't know all of the things in the background that are also contributing to her tears. Maybe her frustrations at not being able to send home remittances because she's working three jobs, but the rent is so high that she has to pay, she's not able to send them in. So there seems to be possibly a lot of things going on in this interview that's creating this great dissatisfaction of the mother. And I think that some of the things that we're able to do with combining these quantitative and qualitative elements is that with the quantitative data, we're able to you know, try to control for certain other things, like the fact that maybe the mother doesn't have a very high income, like the fact that maybe the mother isn't employed or isn't documented, and that can help you understand why she's feeling so sad and so frustrated about being away from her child. Um, um, so I think the Chapsi study is finding some of these things precisely because they're using similar methodologies. And I would argue that more studies need to be done because now there's so few that are doing this. And Richard, um, you know, the, 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 the whole interest for me if, of the African <coughs> cases is precisely the fact that this discourse is so less prevalent than in, for example, Latin America or even the Philippines. This strong, in many cases, Catholic, discourse about it being bad for the mother if she migrates and look at the poor child who's abandoned, etc. And a lot of Eastern European countries now are also very much into this discourse, um, which creates a lot of stigma on the women and it creates a lot of stigma on the children. And as you say, it becomes sort of like a self-fulfilling prophecy. African contexts are actually quite different. I mean, you have some of that, but you, like I was saying, you have these norms of child raising where it's actually quite normal if your sister's taking care of your child, irrespective of whether you're a migrant. <coughs> um, so this, this stigma that children in schools have been recorded to feel in certain Latin American contexts are not really as prevent, prevalent in African cases. Same thing can be said about mothers. You know, there were, again, research on Latin American mothers who are saying how guilty they feel about having left their child behind. This guilt discourse amongst African mothers is not there, at least not in the same way as the discourse amongst Latin American mothers, because it's not about guilt. It's about maybe feeling frustrated that you haven't been able to meet the needs of your child, having fr frustrated with how things are going back home with your child. That's there, but not feeling that you have somehow you're less of a good mother because you've left your child. So I think that the African case is exactly that counter case that you are calling for, um, where the discourse is not so strong. And control group, um, who wants to do the control group? Yes, thank you. Um, so it, yes, we took away the parent, the children who were in our sample, in our original sample, who were not living with one of their parents for other reasons, like divorce or 
um, other death in the family, orphans, things like that. Why? Because it's not because we're not interested in their well-being, but it's because we, that we felt that it would be a better comparison to just compare those children who are living with both of their parents to better be able to isolate what is the effect of migration. Um, Francisca, uh, yes, we do have in our regressions the sex of the child, if that's, that was your question. But does it matter? matter? Yes. And, um, um, I want to say that it wasn't, it wasn't um, one of the big startling findings, let's put it that way. I'd have to go back to the um, uh, regressions to look at that. But um, yes, and then the majority, the, 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 the majority of the situations were where the father had migrated rather than the mother, but there were quite a lot of situations where the mother also migrates, and all of these migration streams from Africa, they're actually quite um, feminized. I mean, there's, it's, it's not 50-50, but it's it's high. It's about 40%. But does it happen a lot if you have two, uh, that would say the, that the mother would migrate and the father would stay ho uh, at home? Yeah. Yes. It does. Although, when the father stays at home, there's going to be someone else probably going to be helping him doing the wash and doing those kind of things. But the father is the official, you know, the, the person who is re the recognized as the person who's taking care of that child. Um, okay, there was a whole bunch of other questions that I saw. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, some migrants, you say, hope to uh, leave their child in the country of origin because of the advantage of growing up in this family culture. And ability to send very the same. So, how about the cost, cost wise? So, the ability to raise a child in a host country like in Europe might cost the in Africa. So, it's quite important to consider the cost of raising a child. Okay, all right. Yes, it's related to that. Because I was surprised by that. that uh, that you said when the, when parents had the choice, they actually opted to leave the children. So I found it a bit surprising, but yeah, maybe it's also because I'm from Latin America and it's not the stigma. <laughs> but no, I was just wondering because I found it interesting for also to estimate the the, the effects on the left behind to take into account this. So whether parents actually have the choice. Yeah. So I was wondering how did you find this out? It was part of your survey? Yeah. Or, uh, you no, asked no, no. The, okay. I, I have a lot of answers to give here okay. to this question. Okay. Uh, is there any other question that's related to this? Or? Okay. Well, it's kind of related to the perspective of the migrant. I'm happy that you brought that in uh, towards the second half. But it seems like you're checking out the, the success of the migrant and the well-being of the migrant. And I was wondering if you perhaps uh, we're looking at the influence of the, the migrant success or situation in the, the country uh, destination to the child's well-being. And I'm thinking back to the quote, uh, Emmanuel's quote or what, yeah. where he was okay with his father and mother being abroad because they were able his father because he was able to send money back and buy him things. Yeah. And maybe he was a little bit more understanding. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thanks. Um, yeah. Well, uh, do you consider the nature of growth that are able to men and women in the receiving country as a contributing factor to, to be able to send them in terms of Yeah. Okay. Where, where this thing so what, the type of job that they had in yeah. terms of their ability to be able to remit. To, yeah, yeah, send them. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right, let me just take those questions and then, uh, and then I'm going to ask uh, <coughs> the people from ministries to uh, give me one feedback. <laughs> um, so you can start thinking about that while I'm answering the questions. Um, so the costs of raising a child, so your question is, yes, isn't that also maybe part of the consideration to leave your child in, in, in an African country that the costs of raising that child is much lower in the home country than in the host country? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yes, and that's definitely also part of the consideration. And, and the third point that I mentioned there when parents were saying actually that they had chosen to leave their children behind was not only that they could then focus on um, their own earning capacities rather than having to take care of the child, but they also didn't have to pay for the child care that is quite costly in, in, uh, in these European countries. So that's definitely something that came out of the quality of the work. 
um, choice, let me just be clear. I didn't want to imply that when migrants had a choice, they would always opt to keep their children at home. But what I wanted to emphasize is that there are some migrants that do this as a conscious choice. And I want to emphasize this because we often think that if, if migrants, if we let migrants bring their children, they're, that they're all bring their children. And it's not always the case. And especially, we found this especially in, um, in the Netherlands where, you know, there is this issue of the language. Um, and a lot of the migrants from Nigeria, from Angola, and from uh, Ghana are living in neighborhoods in the Netherlands where the schools for Dutch standards are not very good. And I can tell you because we did um, research on in schools in Ghana that indeed the quality of the education that they can get in Ghana is actually better than the quality of the education that they can get in some of these Dutch schools. So I didn't mean to say that everyone who has a choice, in fact, a lot of people do reunite when they have a choice. So, um, uh, and then looking at the success of the migrant, um, so, what? Sorry, but, uh, my question was, uh, how do you know this? Did you ask the? It was part of the survey. No, this is part. This, well, yes, we did ask parents whether they had whether they wanted to reunify, and whether they had undertaken any actions to reunify. That we did. But these reasons of why parents are, when they choose to not reunify, or when they would prefer not to reunify, these reasons that came out, that was the qualitative. So, yeah. so you, in your estimations, you didn't include the, you didn't include that as a control, right? Whether they, their intentions, or whether we, um, whether they had the um, desire to reunify and were not reunified, we did include okay. that in terms when we were just analyzing what was making the difference of, of all of those parents who were transnational, what was making the difference between those parents who are, in a, who are uh, having negative outcomes in <coughs> their emotional well-being and those parents who have higher emotional well-being, which is not one of the results that I showed to you today, but that is indeed one, you know, not surprising, but an important variable. That is, if you are in a transnational family because you feel that you're forced in a transnational family, that makes a big difference in your well-being. Um, success of the migrant parent, we could not, unfortunately, this would require you to do a completely matched survey. Would mean that you would interview the children in Africa, and you would then be able to interview and follow up on their parents overseas. Um, we would love to do that if we have some additional funding. <laughs> but we didn't, so we couldn't do that. We, uh, so that our, our results on children are based on children, and children do not know how successful their parents are. But we do, of course, incorporate the things about living conditions, and if the parents are very successful in sending back remittances, then you can assume that their living conditions are better. Um, Anybody want to give some feedback uh, on terms of the practical relevance of this research that you think might be useful or um, completely not useful from your working and thinking about practical um, issues on migration and development? Yes. Well, if I could make it an attempt to say something about it. The two things which came up in my mind, um, one is, uh, uh, in the International Corporation on Migration Management, um, in, and also in practical terms, much is talked about uh, uh, information provision to potential migrants about uh, legal possibilities, but also the risks of, uh, of illegal migration. Um, well, I, I don't know the exact contents of these, uh, these uh, information projects, but I can imagine that it's more uh, social aspects uh, might, have, might have a place in this kind of uh, uh, information provision. Mm -hmm. And it, it's perhaps also interesting to look at the current uh, information provision uh, to uh, migrants in certain countries of origin, to look to what extent the social dimension is included. Mm -hmm. The second um, yeah, idea which came up uh, is to what extent uh, um, for those countries where uh, uh, legal uh, let's say recruitment of migrants is taking place, recruitment, uh, <coughs> private recruitment uh, companies or perhaps government or, uh, recruitment companies mm -hmm. take more uh, or should take more attention into the social dimension because in the end, if 
the parents feel unlucky while working abroad about the situation of the children in the countries of origin, mm -hmm. then that might also affect, uh, well, I'd say, their, their productivity. And yeah. well, that's perhaps um, a very economic approach. Yeah, um, but it's an important approach. And, we, and that was part of the argument of saying, why look at families? Because families are a basic building block of mm -hmm. any um, economy or of any society. So, OK. All right, thank you. Thanks. Yeah? Um, yeah. Hi, my name is Michel Brown. I'm with the Ministry of Justice, uh, Migration Policy <laughs> Department. Uh, I'd, I'd like to reflect on, on uh, that remark you made about uh, what is this of use of, of, for policy, and then uh, focus on uh, policy hitting harder, harder on women. I guess in the case of family reunification. And now, my gut feeling, and that's just anecdotal evidence and what I see happening, is that it could be the other way around, that men maybe are hit harder. But that's just, <laughs> that's just a feeling, although I have some experience in the field. What would be interesting is to get this notion, uh, or this, uh, this finding of yours, and have a... Uh, one of the lawyers look at the Strasbourg ju jurisprudence on re family reunification and see if there is any evidence uh, in the jurisprudence or, or some notion that we can find if there is a, a bias there. I think that such a research could, could maybe help just to see how the law works out. Yeah, yeah. Or, or even so how the law works out, but also how then practicing the law, applying the law, how that then works out also in practice. So, for example, you know, just looking at, um, I think there's probably a wealth of information at the IND that could be tapped in terms of looking at who's, um, you know, accepted and not in, in the application, who's making the applications and not. But then you look at the Netherlands, <coughs> that's the most easy thing to do. Yeah. But I yeah, think it's interesting to see how it yeah. works out European-wide, mm -hmm. European Union. That could be a, maybe a nice uh, uh, piece of work for a stagiaire or a Yeah. Yes, hi. Thank you very much for your very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, my name is Walter Roosterbos. I am a Dutch career diplomat currently seconded to the Ministry of uh, Security and Justice on the Migration Policy Department. Uh, I have two questions. The first one, uh, which is triggered by the one of the very first slides you showed us of a Ghanaian woman uh, working as a hairdresser in the Netherlands, and, um, which uh, brought me the question about her status, because the Netherlands, as you know, we don't have an active policy in looking for uh, lower skilled labor from third world countries, so did you also look at the status of the people you surveyed in the Netherlands? And then my second question is, and I have not very much uh, experience with the countries that you looked at, but I've lived and worked in the Philippines for four years, and what is the involvement of the countries that you surveyed in Africa in sending their people abroad? Because um, you had a, an advice to the sending countries to uh, prepare the people uh, that want to go abroad more uh, for the consequences uh, for their families. But there are countries that are very depending on the remittances that their own people send back. So there may be a conflict of interest because you, if, if you make people aware of the family consequences of living uh, separately, uh, they may consider not going, and for countries like the Philippines and Indonesia and Sri Lanka and Pakistan and Bangladesh, the remittances are very important for their GDP. So did you look at that too? Yeah, so, okay, thank you for these comments and uh, willingness to think along here. Um, I will take on board these suggestions and, and think further about this, what we could do. Um, in terms of the questions, um, yes, we did look at the status of the people. So that was actually the result on showing how documented status does make a difference in the well-being. And that was actually the most important thing 
more important than being in a transnational country was about their documented status. So that's um, important that documented status is also having well-being effects on, on, on people who are living in these European countries and ultimately can have also productivity effects because you know, well-being is public um, and these African countries are way behind the Philippines, the Mexican government, in terms of how actively these governments are actually engaged in and with their diasporas. Although they are, you know, increasingly becoming um, engaged with the diaspora, but they haven't employed any such programs such as Mexico or, or the Philippines. But in terms of what you were saying, um, <clears throat> whether if you give uh, parents information about <clears throat> these effects, whether this will discourage them from migrating. Um, I think that um, what we are suggesting here is not to say, look, if you migrate, there are going to be all these horrible effects. What we want to do is to make, or at least possibly, this is a suggestion, possibly um, give parents a list of things to think about before you migrate. So it's not to say don't migrate. So going in terms of you know these information campaigns, we might not be wanting to go with the current information campaigns because these are um, trying to highlight all of the negative consequences. And I think that what, what we we need to work with is maybe ministries of social welfare or you know these kinds of ministries who can who can actually help parents making family decisions. And one of the family decisions is whether to migrate. And if you're going to migrate, these are the things to think about. And one thing that's really important is the stability of the caregiver. So make sure that when you leave, that you make some clear arrangements and you really think about who to leave them with. And if you think that because you know, that your mother will be the best person, but think about it. If your mother is now 86, and if you're going to be gone you know, for five years, the chance that she's not going to be able to really take care of your child as your child is going is pretty high. So start thinking about these things. Um, that's, so I don't think it necessarily has to be contradictory to encouraging people to migrate. It's more thinking about encouraging them to migrate under the best conditions so that families and family life, transnational family life can work. Yes, but uh, I've witnessed in the Philippines a lot of social pressure on the, the caretakers. Yeah. Because as soon as they, as, as people around them see that they receive the money, yeah which is uh, destined for the education of the child, then a lot of pressure is put on the people who actually yeah. have the money. Yeah, yeah, so that would be maybe something else to include in these social aspects of, of migration and thinking about those aspects. I think you're absolutely right, and we're capturing that also in the African context. Um, there are a couple of can other I, questions. Um, okay. you know, like, can I allow it? That's what happens when you let me no, be the chair. That's the idea. Okay, last question. Uh, it's not so much a question, but this is about preparing the parents before leaving. But you, you showed us that uh, from Angola, which is a conflict uh, hidden country, in those days it's, it's difficult to prepare uh, the parents. So, well, it's not a question, but it's kept to be one yeah. that the situation is very different and maybe. Well, we have to look here yeah. for special treatment. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So I think that the Angola case really emphasizes issues for, for receiving country governments. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. Yeah. Yes, so uh, thank you very much. <laughs>